Sure, so <clears throat> we have uh, staff in all of our residence halls. Our first year students live together in first year communities. So we are able to tailor all the things we do specifically to the needs of first year students. Um, <clears throat> every student will have a resident assistant. Real can talk a little bit about that experience as he is one. Um, <clears throat> and we, we try to keep the ratio of the number of students each RA has to about one to 30, which is actually really unusual for large campuses. I worked at a lot, another large campus where RAs had 70 people and you know, it's hard to get to know people's names. Um, so the RAs are there to do, to get people connected to each other, um, floor meetings, all the RAs meet with every individual student over the course of the year several times just to check in, um, focus on their success. In first year communities, we also have peer mentors. And the peer mentors are really focused on that first year transition um, academically and, and overall all well-being. Um, they have office hours, students can stop by the peer mentor office to <clears throat> ask questions about Spire or academic advising or resources on campus. Um, and we also post lots of resources on bulletin boards and, and newsletters. But we also have a full-time staff member for each community um, who's also available to students. So we do a lot of, although we are large, we host 14,000 students. Our staff is really focused on building those individual connections and helping our students and, and contributing to their success. Yeah, I can just say as an RA, it's an awesome position and opportunity. I like building a community on my floor. Um, they're all friends with each other, which is super cool. So at the beginning of the year, they all really knew each other. They kept their doors open, and now they're all like friends. They just walk into each other's room. They hang out, they do work together. They help each other with classwork. So it's an awesome chance for them to meet new people early on. Um, and foster community with events, you know, it's like pizza nights, or those game nights, or movie nights. And they all just bond with maybe students on the floor that they haven't talked to yet. So yeah, I, love, I love the job, in short. Yeah, I was actually not right. I was uh, in three years. And uh, it was a great experience. Still great friends with, with all my uh, RA staff members. Uh, you know, just we really we did a lot of educational programming, things like that, and uh, and just had a lot of fun together. And I remember my first night on campus uh, when, I, when I came to move in, and uh, my RA came to me. I was just nervous, you know, here I am the first time, you know, going to the big campus, all that, and uh, uh, walking onto the onto my floor, and my RA came up to me and said, "Oh, you must be junior." You know, and it just was like. You know, like so way off the floor, like, just talking about really good at knowing anybody, and you know, and that that, you know, that that person really made an impact on me right away. So the RAs are really, really important. And it's, a, it's a great job once you're on campus. You know, like I said, I had a great time. Uh, and speaking of, of sort of uh, residence hall and residence like things like that, we do have an academic component to that called the Residential Academic Program for the RAPS. You'll hear a lot about those throughout this process. So, um, so, so, you know, what is a RAP? And uh, what does it? What does participating in a RAP do or add to the student experience? Okay, so I did a RAP, <laughs> Jim's did not. So I'll take this one. But my freshman year, which was over three years ago now, when I took this, the residential academic program is basically this class that you take right in your dorm building. So mine was right on the main floor, and they're kept at 30 students, and it's only an option for freshman transfer students too. So you don't have to do it if you don't want to. But I definitely recommend it. Everyone in that class lives on your floor. So it's really funny when everyone, the like, doors open in right like five minutes before class. We all walk out, blend into the halls, and then we walk just right downstairs, a couple floors into our classroom, which looked just like kind of a high school classroom. We all have our own individual desks. And so that was nice to have that familiarity of more of a high school size class freshman year. And then we made friends with each other very quickly because we were so close. We lived next to each other, like Jibs was saying, we would have our doors open that first week of classes, all got to meet each other, formed groups very quickly, and my professor was amazing. She also got us three teaching assistants, so we're, there were 30 of us and four people that we had access to to go talk to for any academic support or anything at all, and it was really more than just an academic class that I got for credit. They fulfilled one of my general education credits. It really helped us get comfortable in college life, like that transition, because we like, took a field trip to the library, I remember, and we met with one of the librarians there who did a little talk with us on the resources of the library. We did a scavenger hunt, which was super fun. We got into groups, and it was all a campus-wide scavenger hunt. 
where we had to go and take pictures. It was like, go take a picture with the statue of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And we were all like, where is there a statue of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on campus? Fun fact, it's in the library. So you can go find that if you want to on one of the 28 floors. And then we had people from the Center for Women and Community come over and do a workshop with us. Uh, all these different resources that were available to us right in that class, in addition to learning about public health, which was the one I took. It was Public Health 160, My Body, My Health. And I just absolutely loved it. All, all good things to say about it. I do not have anything to add. That is exactly what I would have said. And I also was in Iraq my freshman year on campus, too. I was in psychology and peers rap and echo a lot of what was shared. I still have my best friends from many years ago at this point, but we still are best friends from day one of college and really helped me um, get acquainted with the university. As I said, I'm from Amherst, so Amherst High School is a very small high school compared to the size of UMass, so coming to UMass was very daunting. But knowing that I was going to have a built-in group of 30 students who I would live with and also be in class with was very settling for me to transition from a small school to a very big school. Um, and I would just add that we have room for about 30% of the incoming class to join the RAP. So as mentioned earlier, it is optional, it's not required, but I second the highly, highly recommend joining the RAP for your first year on campus. All right, thank you. Uh, so, uh, all first year students are guaranteed housing, uh, on campus housing. Uh, what types of housing communities are available? Uh, and we'll talk about the RAP just a moment. Uh, for first year students, and, and what should they know about the application and the selection process? Sure. So, first year students are both guaranteed and required. So, since we require first year students to live on campus, we guarantee first year students housing. Um, <clears throat> we also house the majority of our sophomore class and many juniors and seniors. And so um, just kind of get a sense of the, the trajectory. Um, so we have first year, as I said before, all first year students live together in first year communities. There are first year communities in <clears throat> almost all areas of campus, not in Sylvan or North Apartments, because those are student and apartment style. All of our first year communities are traditional style residence halls. So rooms with a community bathroom, or lounge, etc. Um, there are a range of options. So again, anywhere around, you know, any of the residential areas, Southwest, um, Honors, Central, Orchard Hill, etc. Um, students can live. We do have both doubles and uh, designed single rooms in our first year community. So there are some first year students either due to uh, ADA accommodation or other reasons uh, want or need a single room. So that is limited availability, but some availability. Um, there's the RAP program. We also have <clears throat> gender inclusive communities for our first year students. We have break housing for first year students. So for students who need to stay on campus throughout the fall, winter, and spring breaks, um, the RAP programs. So there's lots of options. Um, the application process is once a student deposits to the university, um, they will start to get some other information. So if you attend the orientation, um, session today, you'll get the whole timeline. We do not have a housing deposit. Once you've been paid your enrollment deposit, we are assuming that you're living with us. Um, and on June 1st, students have access to do a couple things with residential life. One is to complete the uh, license agreement, just agreeing to the terms of living on campus, as well as to fill out the preference application. Students need to fill out the preference application by mid-July, I don't remember the date off the top of my head, but you will hear it over and over again so you don't miss it. In that preference application, you'll indicate <clears throat> where you want your preferences of where to live on campus. And also, if you have a preferred roommate, you can select your roommate through their, your preference application. You can make change, you can do it on June 1st and make changes up to it on July 7th. So if you come to new student orientation in the summer and you need someone you want to live with, you can request that person as a roommate. And then we release assignments in August, it's early August, um, so people know who they're going to be living with um, and, and where, and their roommate, and then you can contact their roommate, and then you'll get information about the movement um, after that. All right, great. So we, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the students on stage mentioned that they have several jobs on, on campus, uh, and compared to my it's pretty impressive what they do while being full time students. But um, 
let's talk a little bit about after graduation. Uh, how successful are students in securing jobs uh, in, uh, in, in or graduate school uh, after graduation? Um, well, I want to report some really great news because we are coming off COVID and that did affect our internships and our placement rates, but we're moving along and we, we survey our seniors that will be graduating and each of the colleges send out surveys from the dean's office and from the career offices. And we just got our stats for the class of 2022 and 90% of our seniors that graduated in the class of 2022 are working or going to graduate school 90 percent within six months of their graduation we have a lot of employer partnerships and we have over 1600 different types of employers that hired from the class of 2022 and we track the, the success because our student success is our success and we have a lot of resources to help students to get uh, internships and jobs. All the career offices offer one-to-one um, -one advising. They can make appointments through a platform called Handshake. Uh, Eisenberg students use Navigate. Uh, we put on over 30 career fairs and internship fairs. We've got a busy week this coming week. We've got two big career class fairs for all majors, plus a sustainability fair. Each of the career centers send out newsletters and uh, let the students know about employers that are looking to hire for internships as well as full-time opportunities. Um, and we are really doing a lot of outreach. We go into classrooms, we partner with faculty, uh, we go into route sessions, we go into first-year seminars, junior writing, we go in and help with resume writing. So we have lots of ways to outreach students because we want to hear that good news. We want to help students get those um, awesome opportunities. Great. Uh, so you said 30 different uh, career fairs? Yeah, that? this year we're, we've increased. Um, so we've got about 30 uh, fairs. We do, uh, we do our fairs in person now as well as virtually. So during COVID, we all went virtual. And so students um, went into Zoom rooms and uh, talked with recruiters one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the fairs this week are uh, all in person. And we're trying to keep the numbers small just to keep space and um, uh, boundaries clearer. So we just had a, a great internship there at our Mount Ida campus in Newton over the, over the winter break. And we had 40 different employers that are hiring students uh, in the greater Boston area for internships. And we had uh, close to 350 students stop by. And so we, we know there's a high need there. And, uh, 30 career fairs, here we come. All right, and actually you mentioned internships and the internship fair. Uh, and that was, that was actually my next question. How do, how do we help students identify internships and, uh, and get involved? In yeah, um, all the career centers here at UMass use Handshake, which is an online database where employers list internships as well as full-time jobs, employer info sessions, networking events. We also list Career fairs. It's really a one-stop shopping. A lot of career offices across the United States have, have Handshake. And we do highlight some of the hot leads and through our social media with Instagram and Facebook and um, Computer Science Career Center uses Slack to, to let students about opportunities. So we're really reaching out a lot to students to tell them, get into Handshake, look around, these are the employers coming to the career fairs this week, and so we really try to make sure that there's a diverse array of opportunities. So you have so many students here and so many diverse interests. All right, and, um, and, and one more question. How did, how did you ask uh, support building an inclusive campus community? Anyone? I can certainly start. Um, we've been doing, the Career Centers have really been doing a lot of work with um, our students with disabilities. We are working with employers who understand that neurodiverse students, students with different learning styles, are really a tremendous asset, asset to the workplace. So we are identifying, help, helping to identify employers who are changing the interview process 
to help those students uh, be more successful in the interview process. We have employers highlighting um, their DEI uh, efforts to make sure students understand which companies are welcoming for inclusiveness and diversity. And we are really going to be highlighting uh, employers at the career fairs by a color-coded system where they're saying we're um, international student friendly. We're looking for students with differing learning styles. So we're really hoping to, to connect those employers that want to include diversity in the workforces from our end. Thank you. Add a little bit to that. So this was just the second week of classes for us this past week. So we've only been in a few classes so far. And so since it's the beginning of the semester in my classes, all of my professors are always super supportive of all of us and all of the different backgrounds that we come from and different social identities. So that was something in one of my classes before we even jumped into any material. Our very first assignment and our discussion in class was on our social identities and you know, where we all come from, who we are. And our first assignment was like all these questions like, oh, what pronouns do you want to use in class? Like, do you want me to call you? What is your background like? What are you comfortable with? What gets in the way of your learning? What supports your learning? And so just doing that really, I felt like my professor did support me and my learning and everyone else in the classroom by asking those questions and having a discussion on it in class with everyone too. So that's always something like, important to me in the classroom is that we all feel safe to share whatever it is and you know, we're all respectful of each other. Excellent, thank you. So, uh, so now I'd like to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Anyone out there got a question for our panel? Uh, feel free to just uh, stand up, raise your hand, and uh, ask it, and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can get your question answered. You know, it's a smaller group uh, this morning, so it's going to go a little nervous. But, uh, here we go. Uh, are there like, many like, research opportunities in law for like, undergraduate students? All right, so questions about research opportunities for undergraduate students, and, and how do we support that? So, um, all right, so I do research, um, and I think one of the ways, um, there's an undergraduate office for research in the library, if I'm not mistaken, for opportunities for research. But for me personally, the big thing that I did was reach out to your professors because a lot of them are doing research on the side as well, other than doing like the classes and the office hours. Um, so I reached out to my professor, um, and I just introduced myself. And by the time the class came about, she's looking for people to do research, and she reached out to me because I already created that relationship early on. Um, so my my advice always on my tours is to tell students like reach out to the teachers, create that create that like face value. So maybe in a big lecture class, they'll in the video, they'll stand out. Um, and now I do like cool research for ESPN regarding sports, so that's really exciting. And the office he's referring to in the library is the Learning Resource Center. They list um, our reviews, those are undergraduate research opportunities, and we also have IELTS, which is our Institute for Applied Life Sciences. They offer summer paid internships uh, for students studying on various disciplines. Uh, I also tell students, uh, connecting with professors is really good too, that Handshake will have a lot of opportunities uh, for various uh, students, and then if students want a work study job or try to get a job on campus, they don't usually go to Handshake. They go to the um, Student Financial Aid Job Board, and they have their own separate site, and they have some great opportunities. And sometimes professors will list their research opportunities on the um, student board. I was also involved with research my sophomore year. I was a research assistant. I didn't love it. Like, the study was really cool. It was a new mom's wellness study, and so my role was working with mothers who have babies or multiple kids and calling them and working with them to try to increase their fruit and vegetable consumption to 10 servings per day, which is a crazy amount of fruits and vegetables. Wait, it's like double the recommended just for the average person per day. A little fun fact, my nutrition major coming out. But yeah, so that was really fun though to like talk to the mothers, and then I would put all of the data into the different um, program and software that we use and all of that. So I, like, I did enjoy it. It was just something that I left to go on to other things. But another way that I always tell students that you can get involved with research if you don't want to be an assistant is you can be a participant. So I also do that a lot where I will go to 
these studies going on, and I'm one of the statistics in that research paper that you read. So my favorite one was in the food science department. They did a yogurt study in the sensory lab. So I just had to sit down for like 20 minutes and taste test six different yogurts and rate them on like an iPad on say like texture, flavor, all these things. And then they gave me a free bag of chocolates at the end. So it was a win-win situation and definitely you can do that or get some money sometimes also by participating in those studies. All right, any other questions? Okay, there you are. There you are. The transportation, the preferred, you know, between buildings, is it, is it the use of local the buses or, you know, where it can uh, commute between buildings uh, in the past? Yeah, so questions about transportation between, uh, between buildings on campus. Uh, and we can also talk a little bit about sort of around the campus too. So uh, transportation. I can start. Uh, <clears throat> so when you arrive here for the first time, you think you could never walk from one place to another because it feels really big. It's typically not. Uh, walking distance from, from residence halls to the center of campus is not that far. And in addition to that, you'll see lots of students with bikes and skateboards and, and things to transport around campus. We do have an amazing public transportation system here in the Pioneer Valley. It's the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority. It is free for students, and so there's a camp. There are two campus loops that will take you from all the way around campus. That bus will also take you to the other four colleges in our five college consortium, um, to the mall, to lots of places in Northampton. Again, for free. Um, I have lived here a long time and have existed as a one car household because of the transportation here yeah, and the food drivers. So, um, <clears throat> and then kind of beyond that, uh, students also leave campus to go home or other places with, uh, by Peter Pan. Um, so, Peter Pan comes to campus and goes into Boston to do work, etc. You all know anything about that? Uh, so questions about study abroad. What kind of resources are there to find out about study abroad uh, opportunities? Okay, so I studied abroad in the summer, actually. I know I did it, I've done everything. I mean, I'm a senior now, so at this point I've had plenty of time. But so for me, at least the way that I found out, we have an international programs office on campus, or the IPO. So this is where everyone goes, even our international students, they go here for support. So I, like we all just know about that office, so that's where I went and met with peer advisors, so other students who have studied abroad, and they have like, their full-time staff there too, where you go for drop-in hours, so very similar. There's lots of office hours all over campus, and I just sat down with them, and they helped me with my application, everything, I had all the forms I had to do. We have this whole website where you make like, your account you log in, and of all the programs that we have offered are there, so even if you're just in your dorm, and you're like, hmm, maybe I want to study abroad someday, or you know, I don't know if you could do it now without being a UMass student, but you can go into that website and just look at all the programs, there's over 100 different ones, and even if it's not there, like the one that I did, I actually got a petition to do and got it approved, so it wasn't on the list, but it was one that I just really wanted to do. It was a Spanish, um, Spanish for Health Professionals program in Costa Rica, is what I did. So I was in Costa Rica for five weeks during the summer, this past summer, so it wasn't for a whole semester. You can go in the winter break, summer break, or for both semesters if you want to. But yeah, so that's how I found out about it was the International Programs Office. Yeah, the IPO office has awesome staff, very helpful. And I've also worked with students who have done study abroad and then they find an internship in that country that they can attach mm -hmm. um, to after that study abroad or simultaneously. Um, so that's also an option. We also have some great opportunities for our students to do domestic exchange. So a student could work with student success colleagues and uh, maybe study in Hawaii, the University of Hawaii or Arizona, where we have partnerships. I'm also a liaison for students who want to go down to Washington, D.C. and intern in the area uh, through the Washington Center program. We also have another partner in Boston called Semester in the City where students in both those problems can get UMass credits and uh, have a four day a week internship plus take classes. So they can mix it up if they want and they're both awesome programs. 
I also want to add that UMass is part of the five college interchange, so there's four other colleges in the area, Amherst College, Hampshire College, Smith, and Mount Holyoke. And UMass students can take classes at any of those four other institutions at no extra charge. And students from those four institutions can take classes at UMass too. So there's a lot of opportunities to study off campus, locally, um, domestically, and abroad when you come to UMass. All right, thank you. And uh, thank you all for, for uh, asking questions. And I want to take a moment to thank our panel. Uh, a round of applause for. Uh, <laughs>